Good to see everyone. My name is Pastor Steve Winstead, and we started last week in the book of Philippians. Now, we didn't get very far last week. We only made it through two verses. So today, we're going to get a little bit further. We're going to go verses 3 through 11 of chapter 1. And what we're going to see today is a prayer of Paul. Paul had a pattern. When he would open a book, he would always do a greeting, and he would often follow that with a beautiful prayer. And that's what we're going to see today is a beautiful, glorious prayer of Paul. Now, the book of Philippians, it's perhaps Paul's most intimate letter. Paul loves the church in Philippi. He has a deep affection for the church in Philippi, and it comes out as we journey through the book of Phil, uh, Philippians. He uses the word I, me, my. He used those words over a hundred times in just four short chapters. He loves this uh, church. Today we're going to hear things like, I thank my God for you. I hold you in my heart. I yearn for all of you. So we're going to hear that in the passage today. And what we're going to see in this prayer, a big theme of the book of Philippians is the theme of joy. You see, as Christians, we are to be a joy-filled people. God calls us to that. God gifts us with joy, but often we fail to walk in the joy that God freely gives to us. It's a gift from Him. And today what we're going to see in this prayer are some things that Paul connects to joy. Now Paul's joy is totally found in Jesus Christ. But there's some things that are in his life that feed that joy, that keep that joy going. We're going to see that Paul uh, has joy. He's going to talk about gratitude, thankfulness. That's a key to joy is being a thankful person. We're going to see Paul's going to talk about partnership. That fellowship with other believers. That God hasn't made us to do this alone. That that is a key to joy. And we're going to see anticipation. Knowing that this world is not our final home. Knowing that one day Jesus will return and restore this place. We have an anticipation of what's to come. And these things all feed Paul's joy. And at the end of this prayer, Paul's going to talk about love and affection that he has for this church. So it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful passage today, and I invite you, if you would, please stand. We're going to read Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. And I will, I'll always encourage you, if you have your Bibles with you, follow along in your Bible. Keep your Bible open as we journey through. You can have it on your screen or device, that's fine. And also, encourage you to take notes. We quickly forget what we hear, and God may say something, so I want you to hear from Him. But hear the word of the Lord from Philippians. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me uh, of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of God for the people of God, and all God's people said, Praise be to God. Amen. Well, you may be seated. God, your word says that the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. Lord, unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken today. So I pray your spirit speaks. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. 
Well, Paul starts off here with, I thank my God. And he's going to connect that to the last word of verse 3, or verse 4, where he says, making my prayer with joy. A big part of Paul's joy is connected to his thankfulness for this church in Philippi. You see, it's easy for us to let our outward circumstances dictate how we're doing. We talk about the word happiness. Happiness is often based on outward circumstances. How things are going out here, how we're feeling about things. And we can always look. We can always look at our circumstances and wish something was different. You can always find somebody who's more talented than you. You can always find somebody who's smarter than you, who's better looking than you, who's got a better position than you. There's always reasons to find someone who seems to be doing better. And you see, comparison is one of the greatest thieves of our joy. You see, when we start comparing ourselves to the left and to the right, we are guaranteeing ourselves a quick ticket to not enjoy the joy that God has for us. God has joy in Christ for us. And get this, Paul is in prison. Paul didn't want to be in prison. Paul told the church in Rome, he says, I want to come see you. But I don't think he wanted to come on a prison boat. And I don't think he wanted to come be in a house arrest to Rome. That wasn't his goal. But that's how he arrived. And here he's writing to this church in Philippi that he started 10 plus years behind this. And he's writing to him saying, hey, when I think of you, I thank God and I have joy. God calls us to be thankful people. In fact, later on this morning, we're going to celebrate, thank, we're going to celebrate communion, also called the Lord's Supper, also some traditions call it the Eucharist. Do you know the word Eucharist is what's used here? I thank. That word Eucharist can be translated as thank. It's a thanksgiving. We thank Christ for what he's done for us. And one of the great keys to experiencing the joy Christ has for us is to be thankful people. I know some of you are here today and things in your life aren't the way you would want them to be. There's challenges. There's things that you thought would be different by now. Maybe some of you have moved here from another country and you've left family and you've left loved ones and you're here and you thought your life would be different and there's more challenges than you anticipated. There's more difficulties than you thought. What you thought you would be doing, God has had you do something else. And in the midst of that, we can start to compare and get upset. Or we can be like Paul and go, I thank my God. Because see, your joy is not based on your circumstances. Joy is not based on circumstances, it's based on Christ. And as long as we look at this earth and to the people to the left and the right, we're going to have our joy stolen. But when we look to God and give thanks for Him, and we give thanks for what He's provided for us, we begin to taste that joy that Christ has for us. We are to be thankful people. Scripture tells us to give thanks in all circumstances. Not some circumstances, in all circumstances. And Paul in the book of Philippians models that. His most joy-filled book is written from prison. So wherever we find ourselves today, we've got some challenges. We've got difficulties. But don't let it rob us of our joy. Be a thankful, grateful people. Don't let uh, situations rob you of that. I love what A.W. Tozer says. I love a lot of what he says, but listen to this. He says, when it comes to our minds... What we think about God is the most important thing about us. I want you to hear that Tozer quote again. When it comes to our minds, what we think about God is the most important thing about us. How we think and perceive God begins to impact everything else in our life. You see, if we're looking for our joy and our satisfaction in this world, you're not going to find it. Oh, this world may give you fleeting happiness, but it can't give you a joy that can handle all circumstances. That only comes from Christ. And how we think about God is often what dictates that. Are we grateful people? Do we say, God, thank you for shelter. Thank you for food. Thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, who I'm reconciled to. It's a beautiful thing. 
We're to be thankful people. I love what the psalmist says. In Psalm 42, 5 and Psalm 43, 5, he literally says the same thing. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise Him, my salvation and my God. I love the psalmist. He's preaching to himself. The psalmist preaches to himself, hope in God. Do you know you're always preaching to yourself? In this room right now, there, everyone's got your voice in your mind going, saying something, preaching something to you. And what you feed yourself dictates how you live, how you respond. That's why I love that Tozer quote. Most important thing about us is what we think about God, because when we have right thoughts about God and His glorious goodness, grace, when we think of God rightly, then we begin to walk in the joy that He's promised us. We begin to walk in His goodness and understand that it's not based on circumstance. You see, what you think about God dictates how you live your life. And the psalmist preached the gospel to himself. God is good. God is gracious. And that's what we have to do every day. What's the voice you hear most? What are you meditating on in your heart and mind? Worry? Problems? Wrongs that people have done to you? Shortcomings? Slights? Maybe bitterness, resentment? A critical spirit? All of these things are of the flesh. They're not of the spirit. No, we're to be people who meditate on the glory of God and the goodness of God. And as we do, He fills us with His joy. And we can be a joy-filled people regardless of our circumstances. Here, uh, in verse uh, 5, He gives a reason. Look, He says, my prayers with joy. Why? In verse 5, He says, because. Now, because is going to tell us why He has this. Of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So thankfulness is a huge part of joy, but also is gospel partnership. The word here can be translated fellowship, koinonia. Uh, D.A. Carson said that in the first century, this would be like two people entering into an agreement to own a boat together. They've entered into a fellowship, an agreement. They're going to have this boat and do this work together. And that's what a gospel partnership is. We labor together. There are a few things more joyful than laboring with brothers and sisters in Christ for kingdom work. But I'll tell you sadly what often happens. In our flesh, we can look at the kingdom work God is doing through others and instead of rejoicing, we wonder why isn't that happening through me or in my life? Why don't I have that? It's easy to do. But again, comparison will always rob you of the joy the Lord has for you. No, we look and we say, praise God for the work they're doing through those people, through other believers. We're to praise God for other churches in our city. We're to thank God that the gospel is going forth through churches all over this city, through ministries in the city. We rejoice in that. We don't look at it and feel a sense of envy, or we shouldn't. Those are things of the flesh. So a gospel partnership. Uh, C.S. Lewis says a gospel partnership is like this. When you see a person, you say, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. Have you ever been at work? A lot of you work in places where you're not surrounded by believers. Or in a place where you meet another Christian. And you go, I thought I was the only Christian here. You too? It's so encouraging. There's something unique at the bond of brothers and sisters in Christ. And a gospel partnership is a beautiful thing. And Paul thanks God for the gospel partnership he has with the church in Philippi. That's a beautiful thing. Be thankful, church. Be thankful for the partnerships you have. We need one another. That's something you'll hear me say over and over again. Because the Christian life is not meant to be lived in isolation. We need brothers and sisters, and brothers and sisters need us. That's why community, discipleship, relationship is vital. You can't live in the fullness God's called you to without it. And here Paul is praising for the partnership. And in verse 6 he adds an and. There's another reason he's thankful. And I'm sure this. I love that he says he has a surety. 
He is as sure of this, that he who began a good work and you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. There's a day coming when we will be complete. We'll be sanctified fully. There will be no more sin, but that day isn't here. And he thanks God that there's an assurity that's coming. But until that comes, we're going to struggle on this earth. You see, we're still going to struggle with sin. And it's easy for us to see the sin of the brothers and sisters around us. It's easy for us to see other people's shortcomings and forget that we have them. That's what leads to that judgmental, pharisaical attitude. No, we want to lovingly correct brothers and sisters because sin keeps us from being what God has called us to be. We want to live in that freedom. At the same time, we extend great grace. On this side of eternity, no one's ever going to reach a point where we say they've arrived. They've been perfected. That won't happen until we get to glory, but it's assured to happen that we will reach that. So a third thing connected to our joy is anticipation. Thankfulness is connected to joy. Gospel partnership is connected to joy. And anticipation, knowing, hey, circumstances are hard. Circumstances are challenging. This life is not going to be easy. But this isn't our final destination. There's a day coming. There's a day coming when you will encounter me apart from the bondage of sin that this flesh holds on to. And now I'm encountering you the same way. But until we get there, we get to extend great grace, compassion, and mercy to one another. So here he says, uh, it's coming, the completion's coming. And then in verse 7, he says, it is right for me to feel this way about you. Why? Because he holds them in their heart. They're partakers of uh, the gospel with him. They've They've stood with him in prison in defense of the gospel. And in verse 8 he says, For God is my witness how I yearn for you with affection. Listen to how Paul feels about the Philippian church. He yearns for them. He desires to be with them. Is there anything you yearn for? When I think of of yearning, I can tell you, the past 15 years I've traveled a lot. I would travel about 80 days a year. And every time I would board a plane to leave my family, there would be a deep yearning, even before the plane took off, to be back home with my family. I yearned to be with them the entire time I was gone. I loved where God would allow me to go, but there was always this yearning. I want to be my wife, Margaret. I want to be my boys. That's who I yearn and long to be with. And Paul has a yearning to be with this church. I pray that we would have a great yearning to be with Christ. That that would be our heart's desire, that we yearn to be with the Lord and to be near Him. He yearns for this church to be with Him. And in verse 9, uh, on verse 9 through 11, He's going to begin to tell us what He's praying for this church. He's told us why He gives thanks for them and where His joy comes from with them. And now He says in verse 9, and it's my prayer. Here's His prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and all discernment. This isn't a love that's merely based on feeling. Now, feeling's an aspect of love, but it's a love that's based on a depth of discernment, of knowledge. You see, that's the beauty in marriage. You're married to someone, and they have a knowledge of you. They know about you. They know your shortcomings. They know those and they still love you. That's what marriage is about. Someone who loves you even in the midst of your shortcomings, even in the midst of the areas that God's still working on you in. And he says that you would have a discernment, that you could be able to tell what's most excellent and pure, he says in verse 10. You see, there's a lot of good things. But God wants us to be able to discern what is most excellent most pure. What brings him the most glory? Because that's what he says on down through here. He says, It'll, you'll be filled with the fruit of righteousness. One of the clearest signs of a Christian is the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Repentance and the fruit of the Spirit. 
That's what you see increasing in a faithful Christian's life. And here he says, the fruit of righteousness. And why is that? At the end of the verse it says, for the glory and praise of God. That's why as God is transforming us, working in our lives, bringing the fruit of the Spirit out, it's for His glory, for His fame, for His name. And here he uses the word pure, that you can test what is pure. That word could also be translated as sincere. In the Greek, the word is heliocrine. What that means is sun-tested. So here's what they would do in the ancient world if you were making a pot out of clay. You'd put it in the oven, and you would slowly cook that pot. And if you cooked it right, and you took your time, and you were patient, that pot would be perfect when you took it out. But if you rushed the pot... If you weren't patient, if you didn't get the temperature just right, then you would pull that pot out and it would have cracks in it. So what a dishonest person would do is they would take wax and they would fill in the cracks with wax and then they would paint over the pot and the pot would look perfect. The only way to see that that pot wasn't pure was to hold it up to the sun. When you held that pot up to the sun, you could tell that that pot wasn't pure. You could see the, the, the light shining through the wax. That's what we do with our lives. That's what we do with truth, with knowledge. We discern, we hold it up to Jesus Christ, and we let Him shine through it, and He shows us the areas in our lives that He still wants to work. He shows us the truth as we hold it up to Him. You see, we don't compare ourselves left to right. We compare ourselves to Jesus. He's our standard. He's who we seek to be like, to love like. Hold yourself up to the sun. Let your life be sun-tested. And as you are, you'll taste more and more of that joy that He has for you. And I, I love that this is a prayer here. It's a beautiful prayer that Paul has. Prayer is one of the central things in the Christian life. You see, as we cultivate what is excellent and pure in our life, we pray, we spend time in the Word. What are we feeding ourselves with? It's easy to feed ourselves on the junk of this world. No, we experience a joy as we feast on these things. And prayer is a powerful thing. I heard about a woman named Polly. She was a prayer warrior. She lived in the eight, late 17, early 1800s. And for the last 52 years of Polly's life, she was an invalid, meaning she couldn't get out of bed. Her hands didn't work. Her feet didn't work. All she could do was eat, sleep, pray, and she would dictate letters to someone who would send them to those she loved. The person she wrote letters to most was her dear brother, she would write her brother nearly daily, and her brother would write her back regularly, telling her of his challenges, telling of the difficulty of his marriage as his wife struggled with mental health, telling her of the challenges in the field he was working with as those who were close to him would often betray him telling her of the difficult work he was doing in ministry, and she would pray for him regularly, daily, for his co-workers, for the translation work he was doing, that he would grow in wisdom with favor in God and man. She would pray that he would rejoice in everything and rejoice in the trials. She prayed that he would live in forgiveness toward others. She prayed that he would be rooted and grounded in love. And though Polly never saw her brother for the last 41 years of his life, as he served in a distant land, they had a close bond because they prayed for one another. She was his prayer support. And her brother served in India for 41 years without ever returning home. He translated portions of the Bible into over 29 different languages. He started seminaries and Bible colleges. He started churches. He led many to the Lord. And today, there are millions who trace their spiritual faith and heritage back to the work of William Carey. 
William Carabee, known today as the father of modern missions. Yet it was his sister who spent her life in a bed who prayed for her brother over and over and over again. And it was his sister who was known as quite a joyful woman who found her joy in the Lord as she gave thanks to the Lord and as she prayed for her brother and the ministry challenge he was facing. And I love it here that Paul starts off by praying for this church. Praying for their joy. And I see, I pray that's who we are. Are you a person marked by joy? Be honest with yourself. I often say this, the hardest person to be honest with is yourself. Do you walk in joy? Do you taste the joy Christ has given you? Christ gives us joy. That's what this book's going to be about over and over again. And I pray that we here at IEC would be a joy-filled church, not because of our circumstances, not because life is easy. No, because our Christ is great. And we draw near to Him. And we thank Him. And we celebrate together. What is it that robs you of your joy? If you have a prayerless life, I'll tell you, you're not going to taste the joy Christ has for you. If you are an ungrateful person, you're not going to taste the fullness of the joy that Christ has for you. If you don't relish and celebrate gospel partnerships with other believers, you're not going to taste the joy that Christ has for you. And ultimately, if you're Christless, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know how glorious it is, if you don't know how deep your sin is and how rich the Father's love is that He would forgive you through Christ, then you're never going to taste the joy He has for you. In church, I pray that we be a deep, joy-filled people because we know who we belong to and where we rest. In Hebrews chapter 12, listen to what the writer says. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. And that's where we continually pull our minds back to. Fix our eyes on Jesus. The author, he's the one who started, and the perfecter, he's the one who's going to continue to perfect your faith, who for the joy set down before him endured the cross. Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. What was that joy? That joy was redeeming sinful, broken humanity for the glory of God. That was a joy for Jesus. And we get to live the, our lives for his glory. So church, I implore you, I encourage you, fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author. He's the perfecter of your faith. He's the one who died on the cross for the joy set before him, and he freely gives us that joy. I, pr I pray that we'd be a great joy-filled people. We get to celebrate communion now. Called the Lord's Supper called the Eucharist. It's a time of giving thanks. We get to remember and give thanks that Jesus' sinless body was put on the cross in our place. We get to remember that Jesus' blood, His perfect blood, was spilled in our place as we celebrate communion. Now, the communion table is open to all who believe. So if you're a Christian here today, we would love for you to celebrate communion. If you aren't a Christian, we would love to talk to you. We, we, we encourage you, consider Jesus. There's no place else to go. He is sufficient. He is enough. You see, the mind that experiences joy the most is, one, is the mind that is most satisfied and set on Jesus Christ. So as we come to take communion, we celebrate that. Also, um, we, we're going to take communion today where you'll come forward and you'll grab the juice and the bread and you'll go back to your seats. And I'll come up after everybody's got it, and I'll give instructions, and we'll actually take communion today together as a body. So you just come forward uh, during this next song, and you take uh, the elements. There will be an elder or a leader or someone at a lot of our tables to help you if you have any questions. If you don't feel comfortable taking communion for COVID reasons, we encourage you not to take it. 
So don't feel like uh, you need to take it if you feel uncomfortable. We don't want you to do something against your conscience. Also, if there's some unresolved sin in your life, communion is a time of reflection, asking the Lord, is there any sin that's keeping me from tasting the joy you have for me, Lord? And if the answer is no, you probably have some blind spots that you need to ask some brothers and sisters to reveal to you. But today, for some of us, it may be we don't take communion as we need to be reconciled to a brother or sister in Christ. So I'm going to pray, and then the communion tables will be open. God, I thank you. Thank you that you are a good, holy, gracious God. That you are righteous and you are pure. And Lord, that you give us the joy that Jesus attained on the cross. Lord, forgive us for how often we don't walk in joy, for how often we don't taste it. Forgive us for being a people who are often thankless, that we look to others and we compare and go, why don't I have that, Lord? Why is my life not there? Instead of saying, thank you, Lord, for redeeming me. Forgive us for that. Lord, may we have rich, deep gospel partnerships with one another. And may we long and live and anticipate the day when Jesus Christ returns and we are completed. But until that day comes, may we be found faithful. Thank you for your body and blood spilled for us. Now as we come to take communion, may we celebrate these things. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.